Hey everybody, I want to talk briefly about those passages in the Bible that condemn acts of same-sex intercourse. To begin, I don't think there's a strong case to make that they're actually condemning uh, pedophilia or cultic prostitution or sexual assault or anything like that. The data just don't support those readings, but I can understand their impetus because there are a lot of folks out there, particularly conservative Christians, who would deploy these passages for discriminatory, for hateful, for harmful purposes, and that just has to stop. It's unacceptable. And there are two reasons that the folks who would deploy those passages for those purposes do not have a strong case to make. The first is that all of the Bible is negotiable. You may not like that, and you're welcome to not like it as much as you want. It's simply the reality. Everyone who has ever deployed the Bible authoritatively has had to negotiate with it. You negotiated with slavery. You negotiated with polygamy. Many of you have negotiated with misogyny. But no one living or dead has ever even understood all of the Bible's original authoritative intent, much less lived by it. And the second reason is that we don't know precisely what those prohibitions were or what their rationales and motivations were precisely. To the degree we can reconstruct those things, their rationales seem utterly irrelevant to a 21st century understanding of homosexuality as a sexual orientation. It was based on a socially constructed hierarchy of domination and penetrability, not on contemporary understandings of sexual orientation. And we can see this in the way the Greco-Roman world of Paul's day tried to compartmentalize and rationalize different aspects of human sexuality, because men who sought out an active role in a, an act of male same-sex intercourse, that was considered more or less natural. Men were walking around with hammers looking for anything that looked like a nail and so you just had to restrain it for the sake of social implications in many circumstances. Men who were looking for a passive role in an act of male same-sex intercourse who were always considered distinct from the first group, there was no overlap, they had no versatile role back then, those men were understood to be motivated by completely different and usually pathological motivations. Something was misfiring, so that was considered less socially acceptable. It was primarily younger men and boys and slaves and things like that that were supposed to be put in that submissive position, not necessarily against their will, but certainly not in accordance with their will. Now, women, because they were lower on that hierarchy of uh, domination and penetrability, didn't fit into either of those rationalizations, so they had a completely different rationalization for them. Because they were just trying to situate all these different activities on this hierarchy of domination and penetrability. So if we look at Paul, we see no rejection of that social hierarchy of domination and penetrability because Paul reinscribes both of those things in his sexual ethic. However, he rejects any natural motivations for any homosexual activity. He needs that to be entirely deviant, a rejection of the natural order. And so he comes up with this idea that homosexual activity is the result of God removing the restraints that were placed upon human sexuality as a result of the Gentiles refusing to honor God as creator, causing those passions to boil over and result in all these unnatural sexual acts. Because for Paul, to the degree that we can refer to a sexual orientation, Paul thought everybody was a heterosexual, and that any homosexual activity was this result of God allowing passions to boil over. But most folks have already negotiated away the majority of Paul's sexual ethic. Paul thought everyone should be celibate because he was celibate, and so he was reasoning why that was the best course of action. Said that sex was really only useful within marriage to make you want to have sex less. And procreation certainly wasn't on the table because the time was short. Jesus was coming back too soon for anyone to worry about having kids. That's why the thing he said he told all of his congregations was the first rule, was everybody stay in the circumstances in which you were when God called you. So none of Paul's sexual ethic is relevant to today. And the reason that this has not all already been renegotiated away, as was done with things like slavery and polygamy, is that it has not yet become socially unacceptable enough to promote those hateful and harmful readings of these biblical texts, and therefore it still serves people's structuring of power and their identity politics to promote them.